Hi friends, I'm calling you again. I'm driving to training. Sorry for that pause. My roommate, Jasmine Spencer, just called me about something on the way to training. Um, but I'm glad you guys are still here. And so yeah, for those of you who have not tuned in to one of my ridiculously weird and kind of personal driving rants, uh, basically because of my health condition called ulcerative colitis, I sometimes need to use the restroom very suddenly and for that reason driving can be extremely stressful and actually I have some weird thing going on this is again I've told you it's gonna be personal um, I think that actually I've like built this up in my mind so that I actually the the mental anxiety of driving and knowing that I might be trapped in traffic or at a light and not be able to pull over if I need to use the restroom causes my body to like produce adrenaline and then I feel like I need to use the restroom even more. So it's a weird cycle. Anyway, you guys are helping me to break this cycle because by talking to you, don't worry, my hands were not on the wheel, but I was at a red light. By talking to all of you or whoever happens to be listening, um, it really helps me get through the drive because it's a good distraction. And that's how I know that a lot of this problem, it, it definitely is a physical problem, but a lot of it is triggered by a mental um, a mental aspect. So, oh, the light turned red again before I could even get through it. This kind of things are not okay when I'm trying to get to training. But anyway, I'm going to training today, and it, this was a big decision for me. But I'm going to go uh, with the team um, to Portland for the semifinal game. I hope you guys all tune in to the first NWSL semifinal, which will be um, Saturday, the Seattle Rain against Portland Thorns. So, a huge rivalry, but also a really important game obviously because it's playoff time now and unfortunately we did not um, secure the home field advantage so we're going to Portland and it, it caused you know it's a, it's a big deal for me to travel with my condition so I was kind of debating like should I go should I just watch it on TV but I decided to take the plunge and go with the team on the bus which has a bathroom so it's probably the easiest way I could possibly travel to be honest so I'm gonna sit in the back right next to the bathroom and I'm really excited to watch the team play. I think um, for me something really interesting this season, um, well a couple interesting things this season having been pretty much out for the whole season. I'm listed on the you know season ending injury list even though technically mine is an internal injury even though I'm um, otherwise my body is intact. Um, it's been interesting for me because one I, I was new on this team as were a lot of players you know the Seattle roster um, was was like I think there were maybe six returning players I don't even know the exact number but a lot of new players new coaching staff and it was really cool to watch from the outside as the team kind of started to gel and has continually improved throughout the season and that's something that I think is really sometimes overlooked and kind of underrated in a sports league, especially a short season like we have with NWSL, is that, you know, it doesn't, it's not that much time for teams to really um, implement a style of play and continue to improve on that style. But I think that our team, the Seattle Reign, has really impressively come together and meshed a lot of different styles of play, players from different countries, players who have never played for um, Flacco. And the only player who has played for our current coach, and I'm not even playing this season, so everybody is new to his coaching style, and every most players are new to playing with each other. So it's been super interesting to watch the team gel, and it's also been really cool for me to watch um, and, and listen in on team meetings because for those of you who who play any sport where you're getting um, your performance analyzed, or I'm sure you can imagine, even if you haven't, when you go into a video session and the game is being analyzed, there's a, feel, a little bit of anxiety because you know that you've made mistakes in the game and they're going to get called out. You know, everything gets seen when your games are on video, and especially with our coaching staff who goes through the video for hours and hours and picks out every detail and every mistake, which is a good thing. But um, in watching as a player who's been involved in the game you always have that little bit of anxiety and you know the mistakes you've made and you're wondering you know am I gonna be called out is this gonna be exposed in front of everybody but it's been very interesting to watch without that feeling during the video session which I've learned to be okay with but it's still 
um, it still causes that little bit of tension and focus kind of on yourself rather than on the full picture, even if you're um, very secure in your performance. So I've been able to watch without that personal um, connection to it and also just kind of generally watching the tactical analysis and I have learned so much tactically from just watching and observing and also not being too overly focused on the center back position which I still am learning and growing as a center back because it's a newer position for me but now I watch the video sessions a little more generally and really have come to appreciate the tactical analysis and I've learned an incredible amount about the game that I think would have been hard to learn had I had the personal connection to the video sessions, like I said, which causes that little bit of like, um, it's not even self-centeredness, but it's natural to focus on your own performance and how you're impacting things. And even in a clip where the coach is showing somebody else doing something, you know, you're always kind of, you have an eye on yourself to see what you're doing just in case. Um, so I've learned a ton this season through not being involved actually. And um, in addition to that, I think this will be something interesting for all, anyone listening who has ever been part of a team and been injured or ill and not been able to participate for a while. And also coaches of a team, every team has players who are out for certain periods of time, unfortunately. But I think a big struggle for a team, for the staff and for the players, is how you can keep those injured players involved and um, kind of invested in the team. And also as a team, you know, still, uh, still include those players in a way that's beneficial to the group. And it's a tricky thing because it's very easy, especially in my situation where I even had to go home for a month in the middle of the season, so I wasn't even there. It's very easy to just disconnect. Like, yes, I always care if the team wins, but it's easy to kind of um, not talk to my teammates that much, watch the games, not have much commentary. So I've tried to really think of and be conscious of ways that I can stay connected to the group and feel like part of the team um, and contribute to the team without doing so physically on the field. And it's, it's an interesting challenge. And I've kind of realized, you know, as a player who's injured, I'm sure anybody listening who's been in this scenario can relate to this. Sometimes you kind of feel like, ooh, it's not my place to like say anything when I'm in the team environment or, or contribute because like, who am I to contribute? I can't even step on the field. But I've really made a conscious effort to try to speak up in meetings if I have an idea to, um, you know, talk to players after a game, even if I'm not there, you know, shoot a text to a player. Um, to the center backs and say, you know, I thought I thought that was really good. I, I'm impressed by the connection you guys are making. Or um, if somebody looks like they're struggling, kind of reach out and, and talk about things. And it's really hard to do because, like I said, it's easy to feel like, well, who am I to say, you know, I can help you or give some advice or listen and, and hear what you're going through because, like, I'm not doing anything. So, um, but... I kind of have like gone out on a limb and, and gone out of my comfort zone in that sense of trying to still contribute when I can um, in a very different way than I've ever had to think about contributing in the past because I've been um, very fortunate to be pretty healthy throughout my career. Uh, so yeah, I think it's an interesting challenge and any, any one of you who are coaches and or players a lot of people now fill both roles. I think it's something to really consider is how you keep those those injured players involved mentally and emotionally in the team because I think it's really valuable for the healing process to still feel like part of the team. Um, and it's really valuable for the team to feel that they have the support of those players. So um, it's not an easy thing to do. I don't think I've done a perfect job of it or anything, but it's something that's come across my mind and I know um, as a coaching staff, especially with youth players, it can probably be a huge challenge to make sure those players are okay and still feel included when maybe they can't even, you know, show up at training sometimes or, or be at the games. So just another random thought, but I'm at a red light, so I'm going to see if anybody here has any questions or anything that I can talk about because I'm kind of just like rambling on right now. Somebody said, oh, my friend Shala said, could you see yourself as a coach? Um, to be honest, I would say that I don't think my passion is coaching teams. Uh, and I don't know if I would be good at it. I'm not saying I'm 
opposed to it. I really like being a coach and mentor for individuals or small groups of players who are really committed to taking their personal game to the next level and to help them to be successful within the, con within the context of their team. Um, coaching a team, uh, like I said earlier with watching kind of the video sessions and the tactical analysis and learning a lot from them, I, I one, I realized I, I am kind of interested in it a little more now after, after watching and observing as a neutral kind of party in that, but I also realize I don't know if I have the tactical knowledge to like really um, run a high level team. And I don't know if that's something I want to invest in studying or if I kind of just want to keep focusing on more of the individual development aspect of things. So my passion has to do with kind of individual development. So that like the, the smaller aspects of, I guess you'd say like, yeah, individual work. And then also kind of like the macro level, even above team dynamics and team coaching of looking at the whole development system in our country and how development systems work and how you encourage players in such a diverse country to all be individuals and be diverse and use the um, use that diversity and uniqueness to our advantage but then also have a unifying concept where everybody understands the expectations at each level and there's kind of a um, yeah, a clear model as to what players should learn at each level and how we can create a competitive system where we really um, are kind of ruthless and get the best players to the top, but at the same time without alienating those who may develop late and uh, still have potential to contribute as older players. So I would say that, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'd want to coach a team. I, I I think that my reluctance has to do with, I don't know if that would be my strength. So I usually, like most people, enjoy the things I feel like I'm good at. Um, and I don't know if I'm good at it, so I don't know if I would enjoy it. But we shall see. Who knows? I'm not opposed to it, but I also am not set on doing it. Let's see what someone else had. Another red light. Uh-oh, it turned green. Never mind. Unless I can find a question real quick. No, I'll check next time. Hopefully I won't stop and be stuck in traffic because that's the worst. But if I am, oh, yes, I'm going to be. I can look for another question to answer. If you guys have questions, type them in here. I can't promise I'm going to see them all since I'm driving. But uh, let's see. By the way, I want to reiterate that no offense to anyone in Seattle. I love living in Seattle, but the drivers here are really freaking weird compared to where I come from. Like the lack of aggression on the road causes a lot of problems. And I have a New Jersey license plate and I'm not even an aggressive driver at all, but I think here I am an aggressive driver and I definitely get judged for my New Jersey license plate. Uh, let's see. By the way, thank you to everyone tuning in because this is actually really helping me um, being able to drive to training. I cannot even tell you how much of a difference it makes having the distraction of calling all my friends um, because otherwise I don't even know what it is but I don't even feel anxious or nervous uh, consciously but my body has this anxious reaction that causes physical issues that we don't need to go into because some of you might be eating breakfast or lunch and I don't want to share that kind of stuff. Um, Let's see, any questions on here as I'm stuck in this traffic? What do you think about our pay to play system we have in the USA? So that's a good question. And I think that, you know, it's complicated because I think we have these catchphrases that go around in the US, like, um, for example, the equal pay, which is a very important issue, and the pay to play, which is an important issue. And then we have the whole debate on promotion versus relegation, promotion relegation system versus the current system we have. Um, and it's become, yeah, we have these catchphrases and, and all of them can be identified as big issues that need to be addressed and solved. But I think they're all way more complex than what what a lot of the um, conversations surrounding them can account for. And so I do think the pay to play system is an issue in our country. But I also think that we are unique in the sense that 
as the United States, we, um, we're not going to do things the same way as some other countries. We are a massive country and soccer, because it started off as kind of an upper middle class sport in our country, we're, we're kind of set on a path that we don't want to, we want to use the good parts of what we have in our path, which there are a lot of good aspects going on in youth development, but we also do want to tweak it to account for some things that we may have missed or overlooked, which uh, and a lot of that are some players who probably have a lot of talent, or I'm sure have a lot of talent, but cannot afford to take part in the system as it is. And personally, I have a couple ideas, and I think um, some some ways we could change that. One thing, and this is kind of a, a grassroots approach, but I personally believe that there should be uh, futsal courts on every basketball court in our country. I think we should set up futsal goals that are um, under the basketball hoops. You know, if you go to most other countries, you see that uh, basketball and futsal kind of courts are one and the same and um, create places for players to have free play opportunities that are of a high level. I watched this um, this documentary, which I highly recommend, um, called Concrete Football, that's what it is. And it's about um, the kind of street soccer culture in, in France, in the suburbs of Paris, and it's ruthless. Like when we say, you know, free play in this country, you kind of, I think the connotation is like, oh, you just send out a ball and the kids try and have fun. And, and that's important, but I think that, um, we need to be more ruthless in our development system. Like really, if we want to develop the best players, uh, we have to be more honest with our terminology. Is And I think the problem is with the pay to play is that people who can pay get on these teams and they're labeled elite. And some of them are not elite. And the understanding of the parents is that they can pay to get their player an elite soccer experience. And I think that's where we go wrong. I don't think it's bad to have programming that costs money. I do think we need to have more free programming and more opportunity for players to play in environments where it doesn't cost anything and they can get identified and and get scholarship situations to take part in these, um, these clubs that maybe do cost money. But I think that we have a lack of understanding of the, just because you can pay for nice equipment and, and good, um, you know, and to travel to these tournaments and to play for the best clubs does not make you elite. And, um, so I, there's so many facets of this. And I think one thing I would say is that the futsal courts, we need to have areas where players in cities and urban areas can play soccer and be competitive about it. And it should be a ruthless environment. Again, I really recommend watching this, um, this movie or documentary called concrete football. I'm pretty sure it was on Netflix. Um, it has subtitles, so get ready to read a little. I'm so bad at subtitles, but it was well worth it such such a good documentary it shows why you know look at France they won the World Cup and a lot of the players in the French national team and actually other national teams come from this one pretty small region of France uh, where this street soccer culture is everything so I think that we could start to develop a little bit more of that here and that's one way where you can develop players that doesn't cost anything and again like I said I think the understanding that just because you pay for something it is elite and just because it's labeled elite it's worth doing um, is a misconception and it's something that we we can start to address in our country but all of these um, issues are deep rooted in the culture of how soccer is developed here and how it's an upper middle class sport so I think it will just as much time as it took to get to this point it will take time to reverse some of it and make changes but it, it's important to start these conversations and that people are talking about it because otherwise um, you know that's the first step to address the issue and then to for people to come up with solutions and start to implement those solutions. Um, just one side note on this before I try to look at another question on here. Um, I think, I saw someone ask what was the name of the documentary on Netflix, in case you guys didn't hear, Concrete Football. Highly, highly recommend it. Um, and I think it gets to the root of something that I think we need to develop in this country. Not only the street soccer culture, but also the ruthless nature of identifying players who are the best and letting everyone else know if they're average. It's okay to be average, but we have to be able to identify 
um, who is above average and then let everyone who's average or below average compete to get to the top and not just call everyone elite and be kind of soft in our assumption that if you want to be pro you can be pro no you have to be the best to be pro and then from the pro you have to be the best to be on our national team and represent our country so um, I think that's where some improvement can be made but uh, I was gonna say I had an idea of something else I wanted to mention that was gonna go along with that but I got distracted let me see if any of these other questions Someone asked, how did I meet Tobin? Uh, I went to college, well, Tobin's from New Jersey, so I already knew her a little bit, but went to college with Tobin Heath and spent a lot of time in parking garages playing pickup and soccer, tennis, and things like that. And so we have been friends ever since, except for this weekend in the uh, NWSL semifinal, we will be enemies for about 90 minutes. And then if we win, we'll be friends again. <laughs> uh, Let's see. I can't really read that many questions because now I'm driving and that is dangerous. So I'm gonna just uh, see if I can think of one more topic because I'm actually getting decently close to training. And again, this is seriously, I hope I'm imparting some ideas and knowledge or a little bit of entertainment on anyone watching, but more so you guys are really helping me. <laughs> because literally the only time I've been able to drive without this intense anxiety has been when I uh, go live on these streams. I keep wanting to call it or say I'm calling you guys on the on Instagram, but when I go live on Instagram, it very much makes my drive so much easier. Um, and what I, I'm actually, I'm, so I'm going to training and then we're gonna take the bus to Portland and um, I really look forward to training now. It's kind of sad. All I can do is I usually do pretty much just a warm up. And I'm, because I've been out for so long and my body's putting a lot of resources towards getting me healthy, um, you guys would laugh if you saw how out of breath I get from doing like just the warm up. I pretty much, uh, I pretty much am gasping for air when I do the passing pattern, and it's pretty pathetic but baby steps to get back into it. Um, oh my gosh, now there's traffic going into this tunnel, which like usually would be my worst nightmare. But as I stop for traffic, I'm gonna see if there's another question I can answer. Somebody said, would you play over here in England? Um, to be honest, I'm nearing the end of my playing career as much as I would like to play till I'm like 50. Uh, so probably not much time left to move over to England and play there I and I, I love playing for the Seattle Reign so as long as I'm able to play I will probably be um, in Seattle but I actually I, I spent two weeks uh, with the Arsenal ladies going to a tournament in Japan and absolutely loved the experience I thought it was um, the club was just so professionally run the quality of the players and their intelligence surrounding the game was so impressive and I, I learned a ton from the experience and so I kind of feel like I played in England for like two weeks but didn't really actually play in England but I had a lot of respect for that organization and all the players there so let's see New Jersey drivers are the best yeah I actually do agree with that New Jersey drivers like people are kind of crazy in New Jersey and New York but and I always think that when I drive in Manhattan is like how are there not more accidents because people are doing crazy stuff but the drivers are really good uh, let me see someone said they'll beat me one-on-one -on -one. I don't I've never seen you play but bring it on there was some kind of monetary bet though listed that I don't know if I can afford based on my salary <laughs> uh, Let's see. You guys, thanks for uh, thanks for tuning in here. Someone said talk about Ajax. Ajax is my dog, a, a pit bull mix that um, we adopted from a shelter in LA. And I honestly, I was not a dog person at all. And I mean, I didn't dislike them. I just was kind of like, eh, whatever. If I saw a dog on the street, I wouldn't pay, pay any attention. And I couldn't really understand why people were so into their dogs. But fell in love with this little puppy and adopted him and now he just turned two years old and actually it's been interesting because I in my 
attempt to um, learn to live a less stressful life and really reform the way that I live as a whole due to my illness, which a lot of it is very tied to stress and anxiety. And I, I realized that my most recent flare up of this ulcerative colitis was very much tied to a stressful time. So the mind body connection has blown me away time and time again. Um, but actually this little dog Ajax has been a really good example for me of in some ways how I want to live. And it sounds funny, but when people ask like, who's my role model right now? I say my dog because he literally, he's so happy. He forgets anything bad that's happened nearly immediately. He relaxes and sleeps for most of the day and just all he wants to do is play and love. And obviously there's more responsibility for a human in this world, but um, I think there's a lot to be taken for how dogs live. And um, every time I watch him, I like joke and I'm like, that's, you know what, that's a good life. I want to live that way. So let's see what else you guys said. I have another question if I want to coach after I'm done playing. I kind of answered that before, but let's see. Uh, someone said they have a friend who played with me on the Region 1 team. Who? I love I loved the Region 1 team. Uh Let's see. Okay, you guys, I want to see. I'm going to be able to glance really quickly, but not that much, only when I'm at a red light. But I want to see your predictions for the semifinal Seattle against Portland that's going to be Saturday. By the way, I hope you all tune in. It's Saturday at um, noon Pacific, so 3 p.m. Eastern, if I've done my math right. I hope I said this right. If not, please check on the internet. But on Lifetime TV, please tune in and obviously root for Seattle rain if you don't I will be pissed um, but yeah let me know your predictions for the game let's see and also when you predict I want to know who you think is going to score the goals so give me all the info you got someone said 2-2 two, two. well it has to end in a winner so who do you think will win in overtime or penalties obviously Seattle um, oh my gosh. See, I'm in right now I'm in a tunnel in traffic and usually this would be a very bad situation for me. Um, cuz I I don't like to feel trapped like I can't stop and use the restroom if I need to. So, thank you to you all for hanging in with me as I make this drive. Once again, I can't thank you guys enough. This is funny because usually I FaceTime um uh, you know, a friend or family member during my drive, but I actually find that this, for some reason, talking to you guys, maybe because you can't talk back to me, um, is way better and, and less stressful for me. So I appreciate that. Also, Seattle traffic freaking sucks. Um, let's see. Oh, we got some predictions here. And then somebody said, Somebody said they used to play for Rutgers, but was diagnosed with lupus two years ago. I'm really sorry to hear that. And had to stop playing. It's been almost three years, but I want to play again. Do you think it's possible to get back to that level? I always believe that it is possible to come back. Um, I also, though, believe that there's an aspect of listening to your body and seeing if that's the right thing for you. And this is a struggle I deal with personally. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't know the details on lupus but I do know that Shannon Box um, has lupus and played a long international career um, while, while battling and uh, was able to compete at the very highest level and to be honest I didn't even know she had it for most of the time I was her teammate when she was crushing it on the international level so I would have to believe that it's definitely possible to come back but I also think that uh, there's an aspect of listening to your body and knowing if that's the appropriate thing to do. And that's what I'm dealing with myself, is that I would love to come back and play for as many years as I can. But I also realize, and I, I tell my sis, myself this over and over because it's hard to accept, I realize that it's out of my control. And at a certain point, my body will dictate to me whether I'm meant to be playing 
at the professional level or at you know a high level or not and if I'm not able to just trying to push and ignore those signs and do it anyway is not the right decision and is very unhealthy so um, I definitely think it's possible to come back from a lot of a lot of health conditions but I also think it may not be the best thing to do in all cases um, we got a lot of predictions coming in for the game I'll read that yeah, oh, with a hat trick. Thank you whoever said that, but I will not be playing in the game, unfortunately. I'll be in the stands. I would love if I could score a hat trick from the stands. Um, let's see. What else do you guys have to say? Favorite thing to do in Jersey? Ooh. I know I knew New Jersey has a bad reputation, but I really love New Jersey and where I grew up in um, Upper Montclair, New Jersey. It's a suburb of New York City. And honestly it sounds cheesy and stuff but like going out and playing soccer tennis or hanging out with my family at the field uh those are literally when I go home if I'm healthy enough going to the schoolyard with the brick wall near my house at Bradford school if anyone's from the area is where I I just love to go kick the ball around listen to music hang out with my family and and like do what I did as a kid and kind of go back to those old times that to me is um is the absolute best Let's see. Um, a lot of good predictions. Any more questions before I end this call? Because I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna be there pretty soon. Uh, someone said they got sent off for calling the ref something, and I don't know if you were wrong or right. The ref might have been a true statement, but personally, I never think it's worth saying anything to the refs, no matter how angry you are, because it doesn't usually end well for players or coaches <laughs> um, okay well since we don't have that many questions coming in and I am nearly at training and I probably should pay more attention to the road instead of trying to look at these questions I am going to say goodbye thank you guys for listening in and hanging out with me on my drive to training. I'm probably going to do this more often. Let me see if I can actually leave everyone with one thought for the day. And this is going to be a thought that I'm going to try to go by too. I'm going to think of what it is though for a minute. So give me one second. Oh, growing up in Nutley now. Hey, neighbors. <laughs> but, um, Okay, my thought for the day is, here's a thought that I'm actually dealing with, and it had to do with the, the question from the person who wrote in, um, struggling with lupus, which I, I wish you all the best. I can, I have full um, sympathy and appreciation for the struggle that comes with a, a chronic situation, illness, disease, whether it's mental or physical. Um, it's just it can be so brutal and so depressing at times and I think it, it makes you really realize how important the support in your life is and how much you love doing the things that sometimes you can't do so um, I, I really wish you all the best but my thought today is that sometimes I'm driving to training and I don't actually know if I should train that day or not so I try to listen to my body and get the signals of like am I tired how do I feel and I've taught myself for 20 plus years of my life to ignore all of that and go ahead and train and train hard and train a lot and now in my life I am um, learning to do things kind of in the reverse and to actually be in tune with how I feel and if it's the best thing for me to train at all let alone hard or a lot and so I'm driving to training right now and trying to decide um, you know am I gonna train today and by train I mean it's very minimal I do kind of the warm-up and, and like the first drill and training um, or am I going to rest and kind of just know that I'll feel okay for the bus ride to Portland with the team because it was a big decision for me to travel with the team because travel can be very stressful so I'm trying to decide that now and I think my message for today which is a message for myself as well as anyone else out there is to try to listen to your mind and body and um, know when it's important for you to push and be kind of ruthless on yourself and then also know when it's important to take it easy on yourself and that means mentally and physically is there are times when it's important mentally to push through things and be um, be relentless and ruthless and there are times where you need to be forgiven and 
um, forgiving and be kind of softer on yourself. And I don't know the balance, believe me. And I always err on the side of being ruthless, relentless, and physically pushing myself. But, and then when I was really sick, I had to go totally the other way. But now that I'm in this in between where I actually can make decisions on what I do, it's very, very hard to know that balance. And I don't have an answer, but consider in your own life the times when you need to push yourself harder and be a little bit ruthless and when you need to take it easy on yourself and kind of step back and say, you know what, um, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling right today. I'm, I'm going to opt out of doing something or just treat myself because I deserve it and I'm struggling a little bit and I don't know the answer, but it's something I'm going to be thinking about and I hope you guys think about too. And if anyone does have an answer, please let me know. Anyway, I'm getting very close to training, so I'm going to leave you again. Thanks for tuning in. You guys have really, really helped me today on my drive to training. I can't even tell you enough. You maybe can't quite understand the depth um, of the situation, but it's been extremely helpful. So everyone have a good day. Think about it. Do you need to push yourself a little further, or do you need to take a step back and take it easy on yourself? I don't know the answer. I don't even know the answer for myself, so I can't tell you your answer, but something to consider. Have a great day.